At Eshik Eh Arashidne Eh. Welcome to Neheje, our Voices Indigenous Solutions podcast. I'm your host, Lila June, and I'm here with Jessa Calderon, who is my homie and my friend and my sister. We're actually both part of the Dream Warriors uh, Indigenous Musicians Collective. But I'm so proud of her because she just published her first book called Sisterhood, meaning sisterhood and like in the hood. And um, we're so proud of her and we're so excited for this book release. And we really want to support um, not just getting it out there, but also talking about how do you publish a book? You know, because I think for other indigenous women or women or just people in general, we all want to tell our story. We all need to tell our story, frankly. And you never know who that story is going to reach or who it's going to impact. And so we all not just wanted to talk about, you know, the book, how to order it, but also like the, the process of writing a book. So I'm really excited to get into that. Before we do, do you want to just briefly give us a background of who you are, where you're from? Just give the listener just a little background of you, if you don't mind, sister. Yes, absolutely. Um, so hello, my loved ones. I am Jessica Calderon and I am Tongva and Chumash. I grew up in a, a town traditionally would have been known as Pacuenga, which is a Tongva word, but it's the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles County. So I've been there my whole life and really tied into the communities around those areas. And um, I pull a lot of, you know, um, a lot of, I guess, uh, hopes and dreams from all the people around me, you know, of of wanting to share that with them and and help them to pull forward and and in in the best ways that I can show them the way. So I'm out, you know, uh, traveling around now and really doing my best to help people in different ways of healing. But um, the way that I look at it, I I figure and think of it as we're all our own healers, you know, and I think what you do and what I do, it's really just kind of bringing that out of them and showing people how to heal themselves. So doing it through music, doing it through writing, um, doing it through the workshops that we do and things of that nature. So that's where I'm at right now. Beautiful, beautiful. And what was it like to grow up as an Indigenous person in L.A.? Just briefly, I'd love to give people a little snapshot of that before we get into your book. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends what aspect we're talking, right? Because um, we have talked about the Los Angeles Unified School District, and that was, it was pretty harsh, you know, um, there was different classes. And every time, you know, you hit history, you're, you're having to sit there and be told that your your people died out in the 1800s, and therefore you're non-existent, you know, going through the mission system and being told literally that your your people were in day spas, and they were treated so, you know, like, lovely. And and having to argue with teachers, you know, um, so I can definitely tell you I've been suspended um, for being called out, being told you, you, your people cross the Bering Strait. And and when being called out, stepping up and being like, actually, I can tell you, you know, that we have our own creation stories and it doesn't say we came across the Bering Strait, you know, like I've got suspended for that kind of stuff. And I think the blessing is having the parents that I do who gave me that information, you know, from the gate that I never got in trouble with them, even though I was getting suspended from school and being told that I'm, you know, wrong for my, you know, indigeneity and speaking my truth. Um, I've always had that support. But then, you know, you've got the coming out of school, growing up in the hood, you know, you've got the gangbang lifestyle and the lowrider culture and, you know, all of that good stuff. And so we're all just a bunch of indigenous folks who, are trying to get by, you know, in the hood where we're every day being told, you know, um, like myself personally being told you're going to go to juvenile hall by the time you're 12, pregnant by 13, um, dead by 15, because that's just how it goes for you people, you know. So you got people that are being told this and kind of like walking those footsteps, right? And I think um, the blessing, the way that I was raised in the hood was having my parents to say, hey, we're going to go to powwow, we're going to go to ceremony, we're going to go do these other things um, that really helped me to see things from a different light, you know, taking me camping. And, you know, a lot of the people that I grew up with, they never even been to the beach. And we would have ceremony at the beach, you know, we'd, we'd have ceremony in the mountains. And a lot of these youth out here, they'd never been there. 
And so it's like, even though I know the life and world with them, I was blessed with my parents to see different lenses. And I think that's helped in my writing and in the community work that I do to help show other people different avenues for sure. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing a little bit about that. And uh, the Bering Strait theory has been unequivocally disproven. Uh, You know, they say we came across the Bering Strait around 16,000 years ago, but we just found human footprints in New Mexico that were dated to be 23,000 years ago. Hmm, interesting. And they found mastodon bones in San Diego area that had human carvings on it that were 130,000 years old. And even then scientists argue, oh, those are not human carvings. They just fell and, and, and broke that way. And it's like, no, but in any case, the Shumash, you know, one of your nations is, is really known for kind of also being a, a, a fly in the ointment, so to speak, of the Bering Strait theory, because they've been there for 14,000 years that we know of probably much longer. And it just doesn't make sense that they would go from the Bering Strait and down there in like a thousand years and create this really complex culture. But in any case, thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so we're going to get into, you know, how what was the process of writing a book? I, you know, you probably, I, I'm so, I'm so proud of you and I, I admire you for breaking through whatever you had to break through to do this. It's so exciting. Um, but before we get into that, you know, what is the book about and how do people order it? Let's just, uh, let's just do the basics of that first. So I'm going to just hold it up briefly, just the part of it right here. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. All right. So this is called Sisterhood. Um, It was illustrated by Solange Aguilar, and um, she did a beautiful job with the cover. We've got a woman with the California basket hat, and she has her moch. We've got a Pachuca woman and then two homegirls down by the lowrider, you know, to like really pull that vibe together of like what's actually going on in the hood, who's actually here in the hood, you know. Um, And so it's it's about a, a group of young women who were born and raised into the hood, and it just individually follows their stories where, and it pulls it together where they're a collective group of homegirls growing up in, in an apartment complex. And you'll see um, the pains and traumas that some of them have had to endure, but you also see the beauties. You know, um, some of the young Native women are actually very into their culture, even though they kind of do the back and forth with like the drinking and smoking and that kind of stuff but they know who they are ultimately, you know? And so in that aspect, they also help the other young women around them. So together, um, they keep each other strong. They push each other in the in the right direction, you know, despite the trials and tribulations they're facing at each moment in time. And um, each and every one of them all, you know, have their own beautiful success story as well, you know? So my idea behind that was to show, you know, we all each have our story and we all each have our own traumas. Like there's not one person on this world, I'm sure that doesn't have some kind of trauma, you know? Um, And the idea was to give some kind of um, knowledge in here to help people understand, you know, tools that they can utilize to push them in the right direction, you know, by the way that you think, by the way that you move. And and that's the biggest key is moving. You know, when you sit there and just say, I want this, but I'm not going to do anything to get it. Well, good luck with that, you know. So each of these women take their move and and they do some really great things in life. So exciting. I love it. And so it's called Sisterhood. Like Sisterhood, we all have Sisterhood, but then like Sisterhood, they're in the hood. And I think it's a brilliant title and a brilliant storyline and a brilliant arc. Um, to show not only are they having the trauma and making the mistakes in life, which I think every Native woman can relate to, myself included. I'm just really excited for the book to start making its way out there. How can people order it? So um, one way you can do it, I think the easiest way would be to go on Amazon and you can order the paperback or you can also order the, um, the Kindle version. And right now I'm in the process of doing the audio version. Um, and then the other way is you can go on to my website, uh, www.jessacalderon.com, and you can order it there. The only thing I, I'm going to be straight up is it's more expensive that way because I do have to pay for the shipping. And um, the shipping is about $8.20 at the moment. That is so dope. You're doing the Kindle version and the audio book version is important because uh, a lot of us, myself included, have a hard time reading. (laughs) Um, I remember going to Stanford and just being like, how are these kids reading like 
three books a week. So what would you tell someone who wanted to write a book and was literally starting from square one of just wanting to write it? I know that's a huge question, but answer it how you will. Well, I'm going to say there's, you know, there's different journeys for everybody. And, and let's be real, you know, when I started, I didn't have a computer. You know, so I started with a notebook and um, traditionally, interesting enough, I was sitting in massage class with my notebook and I just had this like feeling, I'm going to write a book one day. And, and I just started writing the characters' names down, right? So that's that was where I started was in a notebook. But then I graduated massage school. I got caught up into massage and then that notebook kind of went away. And then one day I got a, a job at this massage place where I was doing really good. I was, you know, getting tip money and I was putting that money aside for my music. And it dawned on me, I was supposed to write this book. So I I was like, okay, I'm going to start taking money and putting it aside to save up to buy like a, like a, a laptop computer. And I'll start writing my book on that. So, you know, slowly but surely of putting money aside to save up, I was starting to write ideas down in this notebook that I had. And when I had enough money to buy the laptop, I started writing from the notebook into the laptop and then just kind of went that way, you know? Um, So first things first, save your money, Um, buy the the laptop, because what you're going to need to do is have um, Word or something like that, where you're going to be able to transfer files to the publisher, right? Um, So you're going to want to do that. And then um, a lot of times what people are doing is letting publishers kind of like shop for them. And... I kind of had this problem with like, I don't take rejection well. So I was like, we're not going that route. So I found two ways to publish. Um, one was through Book Baby. And the other one was through this company called Luminaire Press, which I was impressed because it was woman owned and ran. Um, I wish I can say indigenous women, but I can't. But hey, you know, so I interviewed them and I really um, felt, strong about it this would this would be a good thing it's so dope how you were interviewing the publishers i love that you know it's like usually it's the other way around and you're like hmm do you meet my standards you know, I, I really i really like that so okay so you were you were interviewing them and then what happened so you know she convinced me because baby uh book baby was a really good way to go because you're really in charge of like how you want things to go but you know with dealing with this luminaire press, it was a lot more intimate where I can reach out to them through email and have direct conversations. And, and I had people basically like, this is your go-to person. If you have questions for X, Y, Z, this is who you're reaching out to. And they always got back to me within 24 hours, always. Um, so everything was just smooth sailing. And, um, oh, so what I was going to say was also putting the money aside for the publishing. Cause that was, um, going to cost about 2,500, right? So you want to make sure you have that, that money set aside. And of course there's the options for grant money and things like that, which I guess like as indigenous people, we don't really realize there's funding out there for, you know, art projects and things of that nature. But I just really want to encourage our folks to know that funding is out there if you just look for it, you know, and we are blessed to have Tanea by our side because Tanea is one who um, helped me to get a grant for the book. And so it was a little difficult because even though the grant money was there, uh, we got hit by the pandemic. So I kind of needed to use some of that for personal stuff, but I did make sure to hold on to a little bit of it to make sure that I can pay the publisher. So um, that definitely, definitely helped me to move that stepping stone. Yeah. And and 2500 is pretty easy for donors to throw to the side, frankly. There's so many donors who give 50 grand at a time, a million at a time, 10 million at a time for this or that. So it's hard for us, as, for me as a Native person sometimes to be like, oh, 2,500, where am I going to get that? But it's like, actually, if you just put it out there to your friends, your family, be like, yo, I'm trying to publish a book. I need 2,500. You'll probably get it in a month somehow, you know? Um, but okay, so that's Luminaire Press, L-U-M-I-N-A-R-E press.com. That's really interesting. I like their model. Obviously, nothing is perfect, but like that is really cool that they enabled you to do this. So okay. And then and then what else happened after that? Um, I mean, again, it was such an easy process. So once my book, well, actually, 
I got to tell you the part about where I lost my book. I don't think I've ever told you that. So I was doing some filming with um, a couple of people and the main person in charge sent me the video and I put it onto my little device. Um, what is it? Your hard drive and external hard drive. Yeah. Yes. And so that's where my book was. That's where all my songs were. Like everything was there. So when I uploaded that video, I decided I'm going to put it onto my hard drive, not my computer. And that video had a virus. So I lost the book. I lost the music. I lost everything. What? Like for good? You never got it back? Gone. Gone. So what I did was um, I used to email little bits and pieces to myself. And so I did have like, I call it the skeleton version, if you will. Oh, my I God. I can't believe that. Oh, my God. But here's the thing, because, you know, I was angry at the guy and I was like, you know, you want to like attack or whatever. But I went to the skeleton version and I said, you know what? I either cry about it and I sit here and I got nothing or I take this version and I start from scratch and let's go. So I took that version yeah. and I just started kind of revamping it. And actually, the book started shifting in, in a more beautiful way, the way that the wording was coming. It was more poetic, if you will. Right, and it, right. it vibed good. And so honestly, it was definitely, in my opinion, creator's way, you know, of of putting me back on on track. And so once that was finished, then I, I took um, the files and sent it to the publishers. Um, they took the files. They uploaded it to show me like, you know, um, the designing of the interior of the book. Right. So like the you know, the size of the font, the type of font, the page numbers, and so on and so forth. And then they sent it back to me and said, what do you think? I was able to look over that, do another editing phase, send it back to them. And so whatever I needed changed, you know, they were on it. And then um, we went through two editing phase phases, and then they sent me an actual hard copy of the book. And for me, that was beautiful because I got to like physically see it and go through everything. And I found a couple of errors myself, told them fix this, that, and the other. And then that was it. We had a book. Holy crap. That is so magical. Like every part of it, everything from having the idea to believing in yourself, to writing down the characters, to writing it in your notebook first, because you didn't have a laptop, to getting the laptop. You know, people don't know this, but you're a single mother, you know, doing all this as a single mother um, and just losing the book and then <laughs> rewriting the book. I mean, it's just, it's just fantastic. And I think it definitely proves that like, we can all do this, you know? And um I always say to myself, you know, like every Native woman in this world, if she were to tell her story, it would like win all kinds of Oscars as a screenplay <laughs> because like we have the most dramatic lives and we overcome the craziest stuff. Like almost every single Native woman I've ever met has this powerful story. So what advice would you give to other Native women or women in general or anyone in general who would like to offer a book to the world? I would say get that notebook and get started, you know, sit down and and put your ideas on there and and really work from the heart. You know, don't for me personally, I would say don't worry about what other people are going to think about it. Do what sits right in your heart. You know, if you need to pray about it, that's always, you know, a good thing and let it pour out from your heart. And I think you can't go wrong. You know, I mean, obviously not everything is for everyone. You know, but there's going to be somebody that your heart work is going to speak to. And that's power right there. So I say start from there. And, and you know, one thing I've come to learn is don't worry about how things are going to get done. Just take the first step. Say it out. Speak it out. You know, maybe don't tell your ideas to people like full on. But it doesn't hurt to say, I'm thinking of writing this book. This, you know what I'm saying? Things like that. You don't have to tell them the, I, the ideas of the book within the book, you know? Um, but when you put things like that out there, you'll find that you'll start meeting the right people that can help you to get things done because there are still good people around us. You know, our Dream Warrior fam is a perfect example of the greatness and, and how we help each other, you know, on this journey. So there's definitely going to be people out there that are willing to, um, you know, help you get up another step, you know, but you do have to take that first step of putting in the work for yourself and not 
not expecting things to fall in your lap necessarily, but when you do the work, you'll find people kind of just cross your path in that blessful way. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, even this podcast, I was just like, I want to make a podcast. And there is so much funding out there. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I mean, First People's Fund is an amazing example. Uh, the Native Arts and Culture Foundation is an amazing example that will fund, you know, art projects, literature projects. Um, Seventh Generation Fund, um, you know, you're feel free to Google any of these. They're wonderful groups. Indie In Collective, of course, is doing some pretty massive grants. And First Nations Development Institute, you know, this is just a, a few names that are out there. And what they're waiting for is Native people who have a vision. And if you're not Native listening to this, you know, there's also many amazing uh, funding groups out there that are for the arts um, and, and who really believe in us. And um, we don't have to do that alone. And I'm just really grateful for you following your heart, you know, having the, the guts to have a dream and not only having the guts, but having the guts to walk towards it. And now you're holding it in your hand. How crazy is that? I'm so proud of you. And tomorrow you're having a big book release. Is it tomorrow? No, it was yesterday. actually. Oh, okay. Tell me, how did that go? <laughs> Oh, I don't want to get too into the deeps, but I will say I was feeling very defeated and deflated the morning of um, because nothing seemed to happen as planned. And that's my life lesson, you know, is like, we'll stop planning so hard, right? <laughs> because everything was perfect. Everything was beautiful. Um, I kind of had that that doubt, you know, um, oh, well, surely nobody's going to actually show up. Right. Because like I did start getting those morning messages. Hey, sis, sorry. But and I was like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. It's all good. And inside I'm like, all right, it's just going to be me and and the pozole that I made. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was no, it was such a blessing because from the gate, I, I remember I had a check in with my Tongva relative who works at Homeboy Industries. Right. And mind you, this is a book about a group of homegirls from the hood who happen to be native. Right. And so as we're checking in with each other, I say, oh, I'm, I'm currently looking at these parks because I want to find a location that has free parking because I want to offer free parking. I want to offer free food. I want to, you know what I mean? Like I want it to be for the community where we could get together and like enjoy each other's company. Mm -hmm. as and he turns around and was like, have it at Homeboy Industries. And I was like, what? So they had two parking lots that we could have parked in. Um, you know, they offered this, the chairs, they offered the location. And honestly, it was just, it was perfect. It was such a perfect location. And to me, that, that, that whole story of like, yeah, my first book release about sisterhood happened at Homeboy Industries. And so for the people who don't know about Homeboy Industries, is that they help people who are um, coming out of prisons and juvenile halls and things of that nature to reform. And they have really amazing programs for the homies, you know? So it just felt so perfect that that opportunity found me, you know? Um, so people did actually show up. Yeah. <laughs> and there was a point, like, I couldn't believe it. You know, my, my son, everybody who was there got to witness it. And I wouldn't have believed that people showed up for me like that. But we had a line for people coming to buy a book and get a Hell signing. yeah. And that line probably did not die down for at least a little bit over an hour. And I just was wow. like, I was brought to tears with it. Um, oh, so, <laughs> yes. So I decided to read the foreword um, because I don't know how many people actually like just skip ahead to the good stuff, you know? And to me, the foreword was very important. So I read that and then I wrote, I read um, one chapter, but honestly, um, we were supposed to have artists show up and some of those artists did not show up, but shout out to PJ Vegas, who did, um, who's Pat Vegas, son, you know, come and get your love. Yeah. 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 So, Oh my gosh. The, the energy that he brought was just so beautiful, you know? And, um, I could, it was just so heartwarming to see all my people dancing while he was singing and just there, it was just so, so much joy and beauty. But I think, what I'll always forever, forever cherish in my heart was the moment that I shared with my mother where she surprised me. She grabbed the mic and she had her Chumash sister standing with her and they had their clapper sticks. 
And they called me up and they sang a song to me to honor me. Um, and just the words that she sang were beautiful. But I started singing it with her, you know, and she asked me to stand in front of her. So we're making eye contact and we're just both like in tears at this point. It was so beautiful. And having my mom and my dad both there to sing songs and and share this time with me. Mm. You know, my son was there with me. It was just beautiful. It was powerful. And I'm forever grateful that I stepped out of my comfort zone because I've never had an album release. I've never had any of those things. And I said, you know what? I'm doing it. And so I'm grateful. I stepped out of my comfort zone and I did something that I was absolutely petrified about. And it was perfect. That is so beautiful. And I love hearing this from an Indigenous woman who literally the world has thrown everything it has at you, right? Like the education system was not there for you, right? It was it was against you from the get go. Um, and, you know, like creator gave you this beautiful gift of your son and raising him, you know, shout out to honor. You're awesome. And um, it, it shouldn't be possible for us to do what we do. But at the same time, nothing is impossible if we have creator with us. And like you said, the prayer and the ceremony that your parents gave you um, when you were young, it sounds like it made the difference, you know, like, and I just hope we can give all of our younger relatives access to ceremony because sometimes that's the thing, the lifeline, right? And for me, growing up doing drugs when I was very young, uh, I still had ceremony, like one of the characters in your book, right? Like I was a party girl uh, on the weekends and during the school year, but during summer when we had our ceremonies, I was like all up in the ceremonies, you know? So um, I, at the end of the day, when I was really addicted to drugs and on my last you know, on my last thread, hanging by a thread rather, I just, I reached out to ceremony and I prayed to creator and I said, all right, creator, I don't know what to do, you know, but I have this, I have this way to pray. And so I just really hope that we give access to all of our na uh, native and non-native brothers and sisters, the world over access to this prayer. Um, and it reminds me of the axiom, you know, um, la cultura cura you know like access to our culture cures us and yeah. um yeah so wow this is so exciting i'm so proud of you we'll give links to all the you know how to get the kindle version how to get the paperback um you know links to jess's music videos and music and all the amazing stuff she does and not just you but your community you know you're part of an amazing couple of nations you know the tongva nation, the Shumash nation, uh, other nations as well. You know, you're part of an incredibly resilient, beautiful, thriving community against all odds. And it's an honor to have you here and to honestly just live in this world with you on this lifetime. You know, you and me, we get to serve our people this lifetime together at the same time at this crazy you know, turn of the millennium when uh, the the old world is dying and the new world is being born, we get to be here to help. And it's a huge honor. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we before we close up? Yeah, actually, I like to go back just a little bit, you know, um, how we were talking about ceremony and everything. I really want to touch on on your blessing and my blessing was sobriety. You know, and we had different ways that got us there, right? But a lot of people maybe don't know that I fell in those same paths. And, and I often took a left where I should have made a right. And, you know, the ceremony that I shared with myself the most was that ceremony of just sitting alone and, and praying, you know, to creator just by myself and tuning into that voice that continues to guide, you know, because we all have that voice. And um, when you tune into that voice, whether you're sober or not, it's there to support you, you know, but you couldn't be the powerful Lila June that we all know today had you never took that step forward to sobriety. And I know it was the hardest thing possible, you know, and my blessing was my son, because at that moment in time, unfortunately, I didn't love myself enough to sober up for myself. And that really hurts when I hear myself say that. But it is a fact. I did not love myself enough to sober up. But when that beautiful child came into my belly and it was like told to me, yeah, you're pregnant, I knew instantly that I was having honor. His name, as soon as I heard, yeah, you're pregnant, I was like, I'm having my son. I'm having honor. 
you know, we had an instant connection and I knew I had to do for this child. I had to step up and love this child. And for the love of him, I was able to sober up. And so my wish for everybody out here listening that may be struggling with sobriety is to take that step of looking in the mirror and taking that step to love yourself. Because when you love yourself enough, of course, you want to take care of your mind, body, and your spirit, you know? And it's a beautiful thing for those of us that have access to other ceremonies. But for those of us who don't, sitting alone, breathing, and, you know, turning into self and asking the questions of what do I do next? How do I do X, Y, and Z? And letting the answers come to us is definitely a helpful way to go. And that is ceremony in its own as well. Word. I mean, I can't, I can't even articulate how appreciative I am of you saying that. And while I didn't become pregnant, I did, I was gifted by the creator, something to take care of. And that was my people. And so same thing when I was getting sober, I couldn't do it for myself. I didn't care about myself. The world had, you know, frankly abused the crap out of me. And I blamed myself for all of it. I thought I was a piece of trash because the world treated me like a piece of trash. They would drug me, do all kinds of crazy stuff. So um, at that point, what do you get sober for if it's not for yourself? And the other cool thing about humans is they are naturally warriors. You know, like when you remind them that they're warriors, they're like, oh yeah, I'm a warrior for my people. Or in your case, a warrior for your son. And yet all of a sudden it's easy to get sober because you're like, oh, I got something to fight for. And, and it's not just a cute little thing. We do have stuff to fight for right now. We have languages that are dying. We have children without parents. We have Mother Earth to fight for. And the world is asking us to show up for her to be her warrior right now. And people around the world are asking us to show up to be a warrior for the people. Um just today, it was so funny. There was a guy on the on the sidewalk just screaming, right? He was like, help me. <laughs> He's like, help me. And I was like, okay, do I help this guy? I don't know. Like, he just screaming at nobody, right? And I'm like, I think I'm going to try. So I walked up. I walked up. I was like, do you need an ambulance or something? He's like, no. <laughs> and I was like, okay. He's like, I was like, what do you need? He's like, I need help. I'm like, okay, what do you, what do you need? He's like, water and food. So I was like, okay. So I went to Starbucks. I got him like a big old water, a bunch of snacks and food. And I went over and he was gone. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well I saw him walking down the sidewalk. So I started chasing after him and I was like, Hey, <laughs> he was like, what? And I was like, water and food. And he just started crying. He just broke down crying. And he was like, no one has ever been kind to me recently. And, and he gave me this big old hug and he was clearly houseless and just not doing well. And it just reminded me that like, there are like creators just giving me so opportunity, so many opportunities to be a warrior. And that's why I'm sober. But I just wanted to echo what you said, you know, that, that even if you don't love yourself yet, which I agree, I hope we all get there because now I do, you know, yes. but even if you don't yet, just know there's other people that need you sober and sometimes those people are fighting for you as much as you're fighting for them because they're giving you that reason to to sober up. Yeah, yeah. Can I add to that too? Is um, of course. I think the the main thing about you know the colonization, what has done to us, is kind of not kind of it has disconnected us from nature, right? And as indigenous people, we know that we are nature, and so basically we've, we've been disconnected from ourselves, right? And so. It's really important that we remind ourselves and our loved ones and everybody whose paths we cross is that you are sacred. You are sacred. You are sacred. And let that resonate because once somebody realizes that they are sacred, that they're, you know, they're worthy, you know, because you can't be sacred and not be worthy. And therefore you are loved, you know, but it, it takes that constant reminder because we've been so conditioned to believe otherwise. and when we're conditioned to believe otherwise, we're instilling that in our children, you know? And out here in California, the Spaniards documented um, in the mission era about how loving these people were to their children. To, it was foreign to them. They couldn't understand how these people are so loving to their children. And they beat that out of the people, you know? But that's who we are at our core. We're loving people. 
And we're, that's what we're built off of because we were connected at that point in time to nature. And so now, you know, it's up to us to get each other back to that point. But first and foremost, remember that we're sacred. And I think that's the starting point. Wow. I mean, <clears throat> what you're saying is resonating so much with what my mentors told me when I was getting sober. That was one of the things they told me. They said, you're sacred. And I was like, whoa, no one's ever told me that. And, you know, men, men and women, frankly, had treated me very unsacred, like I was nothing, you know, and like I was just a piece of flesh for them, you know, and I didn't feel sacred after that. I felt tainted. I felt bad. I felt like just the opposite of sacred. So then when, but when my elders told me that I knew it was true, I was like, wow. And it was just such a, so I want to say that too, to all the listeners, you know, you are sacred, you are completely sacred. And it's easier for us to look at a star and be like, wow, that's sacred. Or look at a tree and be like, yeah, that's sacred. Or a deer and say, oh, that's sacred. But we are of the same nature that those things are. We are just as important as a rock or a tree or a cat or a bumblebee, you know, we are a part of this creation. We're a square in the quilt of creation as much as any other living being. And thus any love and adoration you give to a star, you automatically give to your own self because we are part of the same web of creation. And so, yes, you are sacred. And I'm just so grateful for you, sister, for, um, you know, going through the life journey that you went through, which uh, it was challenging, but you you made it through through prayer. And now par part of it is reflected in this book. So just so grateful that it's here. You know, obviously people check it out. And thank you for inspiring us, sister, to to reach inside and find our own voice and even like a little logistical avenue. Like, how do you even do this? You know, to actually get it out there in the world. Um, so that native people and all people are more represented in the uh, literature, the library of the world, which we're not very well represented. So every single book we write, there literally couldn't be enough books written by native authors. I don't think that's possible because we have to make up for 500 years of being systematically excluded from the liter literary canon. So we got to get out there. We got to tell our stories just like it's happening in TV and in film. And it's just super exciting to be a part of this moment. Yeah. And the time is now. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, sister, unless there's anything else you'd like to say. Um, thank you for being here on Hijet. And thank you to all our listeners. You know, we uh, really appreciate you. And more than anything, we just hope we can, you know, help you on your journey, whatever you're going through, and just give you a little extra spark or a little extra something to help you out there. That's why we do this. So thank you all for tuning in and know that even though we may not know you personally, we, we see you as a family and we're excited that we had this chance to connect in this way. So thank you, Jessa Calderon. Um, www.jessacalderon.com uh, check her out and we'll see you soon mm -hmm.